Well, good morning, everyone. It's Russ Barkley here. And today I'm going to do our final research review. It saddens me to have to report that this will be my last weekly research review for you. However, my advancing age, along with some encroaching medical difficulties that go with that aging, as well as my desire to travel more and spend more time with family and friends, has led to this decision that it's time for me to give up this weekly research review and the time commitment that it requires. So uh, my apologies for that, but on the other hand, uh, that's life and it's time to get on with that life. But I want to take a moment and instead of telling you dad jokes, to thank you all for watching not only this channel, but especially these weekly research reviews. Uh, I'm amazed at how many people found these to be interesting. Uh, anywhere from up to 6,000 people or more were watching these weekly research reviews. And that just really warms my heart that people are so interested in the research out there that's going on on ADHD and related disorders. So thank you all for watching. I will continue to occasionally drop commentary videos on what I think are significant topics in ADHD, but I'll be cutting back on those as well. That is cutting back on their frequency. So uh, again, my thanks to all of you for watching these research reviews for the past two and a half years. We have reviewed several hundred research papers, and I have had to look at several thousand such papers in order to extract what I thought were the most meaningful scientific papers. So uh, thank you again for not only subscribing, but for watching these research review videos. Okay, let's get started. We've got four articles to discuss this morning. And as always, I've listed these articles as well as their hot links in the description that goes with this video. First up is an interesting paper that was published earlier, uh, let's see, about three weeks ago, according to what I see here on the screen. Uh, and apparently it got a lot of play down in Australia because it is research that was done in Australia. And the media picked up on this study and unfortunately reported some of the findings, I think incorrectly, that is interpreted those findings incorrectly. So let's have a look at this very large study that followed children from around age four to five at kindergarten up to age 17 with nearly annual reevaluations of the children and their quality of life. And what did the study find? Well, the most important finding to me is that this study, which was reported in the Journal of Attention Disorders, by the way, found, as you would expect, that children with higher levels of ADHD symptoms had lower levels of quality of life than did children without ADHD. So that's really what the study is saying. Uh, these findings held up across the entire follow-up period. In addition, I noticed in some of the tables that there was somewhat of a worsening in the ratings of quality of life with age. So also the study authors reported that children who had additional comorbid disorders, internalizing disorders like anxiety and depression and externalizing disorders like conduct disorder, oppositional disorder, had even lower levels of quality of life than, than did the ADHD individuals without those comorbidities. So that's generally what this study is showing. And by the way, many previous studies have found this to be the case as well. So no surprise there. But the finding that got picked up by the media, particularly in Australia, requires some clarification. And that is, if you look down here, the authors reported that children taking stimulant medication had lower levels of quality of life and children who didn't take medication. And of course, the press went crazy with that. I've been told by some subscribers down there in Australia claiming that C, medication treatment not only doesn't help, but actually could make quality of life worse. Well, that is a 
terrible misinterpretation of the findings of this study. Because if you actually read the study, which I did, you find out that the study is confounded with the severity of ADHD in those on medication versus those with ADHD not taking medication. The authors even report in the discussion section that kids taking medication had much more severe ADHD symptoms than the children with ADHD who didn't take medication. They also found that those children had more difficulties with parental mental health, as you would expect if ADHD is more severe, and there were other complications as well. So in general, this study does not show that taking medication makes quality of life worse. In order to do that, you would have to compare the same children before starting medication and then after starting medication, which is not what this study does at all. So once again, we see that correlation doesn't imply causation. And in this case, the relationship of medication to quality of life is most likely explained by those on medication having a more severe disorder. So it's the more severe disorder that's related to lower quality of life, not necessarily taking the medication, which of course makes no sense whatsoever when you look at the vast number of other articles that have compared children before and after taking medication on improvements in many areas of their life course outcomes. Uh, so once again, the media gets it wrong, almost suggesting that there's kind of a narrative out there always looking for negative publicity about ADHD medication. Well, I'm sorry, journalists, this study does not show that whatsoever. Okay, let's move on to a study that was done uh, over in, I believe this was, hold on, yes, this is done in Italy, I thought so. Just had to correct myself. That's my aging brain, another reason why I'm probably gonna um, have to give up doing these uh, research reviews. So here's a study on the effects of medication on hoarding symptoms in adults with ADHD. It was done, as I said, in Italy. It was published over in the Journal of Psychiatric Research, as you see here. And as we scroll down, we can see that there were 60 newly diagnosed individuals with adult ADHD. They were evaluated both before and after taking medication for at least a year. And the study finds that medication resulted in a significant reduction in hoarding behavior and specifically in the propensity for excessive acquisition of material goods as well as excessive clutter, but it did not affect the aspect of hoarding with regard to getting rid of hoarding materials, that is discarding. So medication appears to help with two of the three aspects of hoarding behavior, but not with that having to do with the decision to discard material. So why do we talk about this? Because you know that I've had several videos earlier on this channel showing that adults with ADHD are much more prone to hoarding behavior, particularly with greater inattention symptoms being predictive of greater hoarding behavior in those individuals. And this study shows that medication treatment for at least a year did result in some improvement in hoarding behavior. So some good news there for individuals who might have hoarding behavior as a comorbidity and showing that medication might be helpful to them. Okay, let's have a look here at another article that was published over in Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology. And this was done by uh, individuals at Johns Hopkins University at the Kennedy Krieger Center, which does a lot of research on ADHD as well as autism spectrum and other neurodevelopmental disorders. This is a study of brain white matter morphology and connectivity over time in children with ADHD. So it's a study that's going to be comparing 99 children with ADHD to 73 children without ADHD. And these children were assessed between 8 and 12. And again, as adolescents between 12 and 17. And 
the authors used diffusion tensor imaging, which is a way of analyzing MRI scans uh, and looking at white matter connectivity, that is the morphology of white matter connecting tracks in the brain over time. And the authors found that over time, there was an increase in connectivity, and the greater the increase, the greater the improvement in ADHD symptoms, and especially hyperactivity and impulsivity. They did find that the uh, higher fiber concentrations in the cortical spinal and parietal occipital areas were particularly associated with greater improvement in ADHD symptoms over time. So here's a really nice study showing that increased connectivity with age is related to improvement in ADHD symptoms in these children. Very nice study there on white matter morphology. Now, my final study comes to us from, let's see, I believe this was done, yes, in Iowa City, Iowa, and also at my first employer, the Medical College of Wisconsin. This is a study of urology patients with ADHD looking at their degree of bowel and bladder dysfunction, that's what BBD means, looking at their response to intervention for that bowel and bladder uh, disorder or dysfunction treatment. And of course, we have known for a long time that ADHD is associated with an increased frequency of bowel and bladder disorder or dysfunction. And this study, of course, documents that. Uh, and it also shows that when you compare individuals with bowel and bladder dysfunction with ADHD and without ADHD, the bowel and bladder dysfunction is worse in those with ADHD. So ADHD not only increases risk for BBD, but also uh, is likely to be associated with worse BBD than is seen in non ADHD patients seen in this, uh, these two urology practices. Uh, they did find that ADHD medication uh, was helpful to some extent with certain kinds of interventions, such as what are here referred to as urotherapy interventions, but may not necessarily have proven useful to responding to the other interventions that were being tried here. So overall, the study finds, as they conclude here, that children with ADHD, regardless of their medical therapy status, had more severe BBD than peers with BBD alone and no ADHD. Patients not taking ADHD medications did improve with the BBD treatment, but those taking medication might have shown a little bit more responsiveness to certain behavioral interventions than those not taking medication. So overall, yet another study showing ADHD individuals, children that is, much more prone to bowel and bladder dysfunction. Okay, thank you again for watching this research review and for watching all of the other research reviews. I'm extremely grateful to you for your interest in the research on ADHD. And while it does sadden me to have to tell you that this is my final research review, on the other hand, I'm looking forward to using what quality of life I have left to do more travel, spend more time with family and with my companion, and basically enjoy the life that I have remaining. Thank you all so much for watching this review. And as always, I end this final review with my words of wisdom to you, and that is to live well, be well, and take care. Thank you, everybody.